Hi friends, welcome to the Ian Khan Show. My guest today is from Aftershock. He's a co-contributor to the book and I'm talking to Dr. Eris Persidis today. He's president of BioVista and a uh, multiple times award winner. He's been published more than 80 papers and book chapters. He's lectured at Wharton, Columbia School, George Washington University, University of Auckland Business School. He's a frequent speaker at major international meetings as an, and an expert evaluator for the European Union. He has served on tons of committees and is one of the world's most sought after experts. Please welcome Hi, and welcome Presidents. to the Ian Khan Show. We're doing a special episode, and this is a series that features one of the contributors from a recent book called Aftershock. Joining me today in this episode is Aris Persidis. Now, Aris is amazing. He's done a tremendous amount of work in his career, and we're going to talk about healthcare, AI, the impact of technology on the future, and a lot of good things. So welcome to the show. Aris, welcome on board. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Nice for you to uh, have me on the show. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. I was so humbled to be a contributor to Aftershock, and I say this to everybody who's watching this series, is buy Aftershock. If you don't have the money to buy it, tell me where you live and I will send you a copy of this book. Because 50 different people, including yourself and me, we contributed to this book with with our insights, with our uh, what we think is going to determine the future of humanity. And I believe the collective insights of all the 50 futurists in there, it's mind blowing. It is a must read for any leader, professional, and anyone who wants to really succeed in the future. Eris, tell me about your experiences on writing about uh, the future for this book especially. Yeah, and I'm, I'm with you. It was such a humbling experience to be invited to be part of this incredible collection of people who wrote these essays. And one of the things that I found challenging was to try to point out, like you said, from personal experiences, an angle to the theme of how do I prepare for the future that would be relevant, that came from the heart, that came from the mind, but would be relevant and reflective of not just my own experiences, but of what we all see around us. So that was the, the challenge, to make it relatable to the next 50 years, but looking into the past 50 years, not an easy task. Yeah. But I enjoyed it for sure, like I'm sure you did too, right? Absolutely. And you know what? I'm doing this series of podcasts just to extract that information that's in the written word to more of a visual communication. And, and I just want this to reach everybody that we can online, through podcasts, through different channels, because I really yep. believe in the message that every single contributor has contributed to in the book. Now, going to your message, I yep. was really intrigued reading about uh, some of the things that you've written, which are more about, hey, how do we really understand the future? What, what is Future Shock all about? And for those of us who have not seen any of these uh, video episodes before, uh, Alvin Toffler wrote Future Shock 50 years ago. 50 yeah. years have passed since that book came out. It was a revolution at that time. Uh, Alvin Toffler, an amazing uh, futurist, thinker, thought leader. And now, 50 years later, we have this book that says, what exactly is happening post that book today? And it's yeah. called Aftershock. So you tell me, Eris, what do you think has happened since then? And how do you see the world has evolved until now, until now? You know, I think um, a lot of the authors and contributors to the to the book pointed out the steps between 50 years ago and now, how much of the prediction has come true, where it's come more true, less true, and, and th things of that ilk. And I think that alone is worth the price of admission to, to read the book. For me, what struck me actually thinking uh, about it a little bit was the expectation of amazing things. It's at the time, if we go back in time, this is the time when post-World War II, 20 years later, the generations are beginning to come through. They're beginning to see potential in the world. There's a lot of excitement. There is a lot of fear because of the, all the new technologies, atom bomb and, and so on, the Cold War. The geopolitics are very much in reflux, right? Very much changing and so on. People are realizing a lot of the things that you write about, the self-potential, the self-actualization. A lot of social things are happening. 
But at the same time, the technological evolutions that we were all marveling 50 years later, we take them for granted. And so that was the piece that for me was the emotional and intellectual anchor for, the pa- for looking at the past 50 years and then looking at the next 50 years. Are we expecting these things and therefore not appreciating what it takes to make them? Absolutely. Now, you've done a tremendous amount of work and you continue to do that work in the healthcare space. It's your, it's your domain of expertise. There's so much happening in healthcare. And while there is so much happening in healthcare, we also have something like the coronavirus, which is really yeah. happening right now. So, so it all goes to thinking that, okay, if we are technologically so advanced and we're using um, different ways to do, do different things now, yeah. how how can we have something as an outbreak of a disease and where, where people are suffering and there's all of those things happening? There's also things such as malaria and typhoid and uh, oh, diarrhea yeah. and things that diseases and conditions that are prevalent in um, impoverished countries and places where there isn't access to basic health care. I believe over two, uh, it's, it's about two billion people don't have access to basic health care. Uh, over a billion people don't have access to um, a, a toilet in the world. So there's all these things uh, as well. What are your insights? Let's open it up a little bit. What's, what sure. are your um, insights, first of all, on de- the development of the healthcare industry, whether it's drugs, diagnosis? How do you yeah. see that evolving right now? Ian, you bring up coronavirus and it's a great example, uh, but then let's take each other back and, and, our, and, the, and your audience here. Uh, remember HIV when it first came out? Yeah. Um, and the numbers there, of course, ballooned in the same way as hopefully coronavirus won't have the same effect, but it probably will. And nobody really knows because at least we are trying to be ahead of it just a little bit. But it is not as if we have encountered these times of these types of epidemics before. It is not as if we have encountered a virus that we know nothing about the jump species and did a whole bunch of things that we haven't encountered before. Right. And but I think the critical thing that you mentioned is that on any given day, there are so many other things that are taking the lives of people, so many other infectious diseases and not just infectious diseases, but social things to access to medicine, access to water, access to sanitation, to electricity, to, to good milk, all of those things. So I think this is just one example of a more endemic thing on planet Earth that we have to that we have to understand. And if I think of it, if I think of just the tiny world I occupy, which is one of the parts of healthcare, for sure we are better at figuring out what happened and how we could intercede, not whether we will be successful or not, than we were at the beginnings of HIV, Ebola, and, and so on. But uh, that doesn't guarantee success. All I see are similarities to things that have happened in the past. And I have the hope that uh, technologically we're a bit better at dealing with them. Yeah. So, uh, Eris, you've been working on AI for many, many years, especially within the healthcare industry. Tell tell us a little bit about what is your work? What has it been all about? What have you been doing for the last two decades? For, For some reason, I fell in love with information and data. And I fell in love with the idea that While it is excellent to invest in finding out new things, if we also invest in recapitulating what we know and maximizing the value of what we have already invested in, maybe we stand a better chance of being more efficient in how we learn and progress as a species. So that's the theory of it, right? So in in plain language, for me, it translates, can I look back into all this massive amount of information in healthcare and see if I can rebuild it in new ways to find out something new? So as I think I mentioned to you before we, we started, I've got a nine-year-old boy. We play with Legos all the time. So, so here is the version of AI in Lego speak. And no, Lego did not give me uh, shares or anything like that. I, yeah, I'm sure yeah. we, all, <laughs> we all sympathize. So imagine a bucket of Legos and um, you dump it on the floor and you play, right? And today's AI, typical AI, machine learning, will be a camera that will float above your living room and your wife will be controlling it to see what you're, what you're doing and it will measure and count and classify all the bricks in the bucket. And after a thousand bricks, a thousand buckets rather, when, you, when the camera sees a new bucket, it will say, oh, I think this is what's in your bucket. And everybody needs a technology that tells what's in your bucket, right? 
But if my little boy, who does this quite frequently, goes out in the yard, picks up a little pebble that looks like a Lego, puts it in the bucket, then that AI is stumped because it has never seen a pebble before. So I will have to train it with pebbles. And that's the issue with today's AI, that every time you have a different idea to apply to, you have to train it again and again and again. Yeah. Yeah. And who is to decide what's the right training set, what are the right benchmarks and so on. So nevertheless, it works reasonably well. Mm. So we had this crazy idea that instead of measuring the Legos and counting the Legos and classifying them, which is what machine learning is, we will do something that we call machine building. We will be like little kids. We will take the pieces of Lego and we will build everything that can be built with that bucket of Legos. So now, instead of measuring and classifying, which is machine learning and typical AI, machine building will generate all possible solutions with the data in hand. And then it will ask the question, do any of these fit whatever problem I'm trying to solve? Yeah. So that's what we've been doing the last uh, several years. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's uh, very exciting and, and does a whole bunch of, uh, of great things. Not just yeah. in healthcare. That's yeah. the interesting. So, what, what are if and if you can share, uh, what are some of the outcomes uh, that this could lead to in a specific industry where there's some challenges? Help us understand because what my objective also is to help massively simplify and make relatable oh, AI. Yeah. How does it? What's the next step after that? So you've got, let's say, a set amount of data, whether it's healthcare data, behavioral data. Um, any open any kind of information but yeah. of course at a at a big scale not just a small set because yeah. you're saying that you want to be able to teach ai and you need a, the larger the set of the data the better it is is that correct not necessarily so traditional yeah. ai needs the more data it has the better it is but then you have the problem of how will you pick the data set to train it on and this okay. is what we wanted to break. We, we wanted to do it like the human brain in a, in, in a way, like everybody does. So the idea itself is not new. But the yeah. human brain, based on what it has, and sometimes it will have little, sometimes it will have a lot, but yeah. it can always make these inferences yeah. and generate hypotheses, yeah. even if those hypotheses will end up being off the beaten track, at least Correct. initially. So we wanted to make systematic the process of developing new ideas that have never been seen before. Mm. Because again, one of the ways to, simply, to simplify the understanding of this is that typical AI does not tell you something that you have not seen before. Mm -hmm. It makes connections based on what you have trained it on. So it Correct. has already seen these things. But when I trained it on a bucket of Legos, I did not anticipate the pebble. There is yes. no way I would have anticipated the pebble or the shoe whatever my little boy would put into that thing. Yes. So I have to have the ability to take data, just like you and I and everybody seeing this does every millisecond of every day and resynthesize it. This was the thing, the innovation, if you like, that we came up with, the resynthesis of existing data to mm -hmm. generate an output that has never been seen before. It is not in any training set. Yeah. Just to give you an example, yeah. here is a medicine that works in ovarian cancer. Well, I just figured out that it could also work in Alzheimer's disease. Here is a, a medicine that works for depression. Mm -hmm. Well, I just figured out that it can work in cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes these links are made with a lot of data or these yeah. hypotheses are generated with a lot of data. Mm -hmm. Other times with very little data, but it's just like a Lego. Um, you take one brick, there are countless possibilities from that one yes. break. You take so there's one also, individual data. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. There's an, and the, another analogy that I can think of is, um, and I don't remember who said this. Uh, it was in one of the interviews that, you know, the AI of the future is also about, uh, you know, the AI of today is very, gen it's, it's artificial narrow intelligence that it just does one thing at a time. But, yes. but where we, we might be headed into the era of artificial general intelligence where yes. technology is now able to say, hey, this new object that I'm looking at is not in my current data set, but I think I know what this is. And it, it makes a decision based on what it thinks it could be. 
Is Absolutely. that what artificial general intelligence could be? Oh, uh, Ian, you, you said it perfectly. And maybe the only um, evolution of that idea is that we would call it augmented general intelligence instead of artificial. So mm. I, I think that's a, that's a fairer description. And again, the term artificial intelligence and the, the bit artificial was very sexy, very appropriate at the time. But now with the benefit of hindsight and, and what we know, perhaps a little bit better, to call it augmented is is much more accurate may, may not be as uh, as interesting to some people but it is actually more valid and if you think about it it correctly places this relationship that's another one of those of those things that i was very interested by your your essay of actualizing yeah. an individual and their potential and so on so yeah. augmenting our capabilities to do some things that we simply can't is not a bad thing we're wearing clothes to protect ourselves from the cold yeah. that's augmented technology correct so our if, brain is the same mm -hmm. if we if we go back to the example of the coronavirus which is yeah happening right now would we and so the the thing is that there's no cure for it right now somebody's working on it they're working on a vaccine yes and what what i understand now is that in in a situation like this you're just looking at options of what could potentially be a vaccine by uh, you know doing the process of creating a vaccine making sure it works and it's all about data isn't it about data again like the more data you can put through this whole vaccine creation process drug discovery whatever you call it and that's literally it so would you be able to perhaps make some kind of a the idea of a digital twin as we know it would you be able to do a digital twin of the coronavirus and maybe run simulations on it to AI or whether it's augmented general intelligence or artificial yeah. general intelligence, run billions of scenarios in it in, in a short amount of time. Tell me about that's that exactly part. You know where I'm going, right? Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. And, and that's, that's the whole idea. Um, one of the interesting things is that um, we should not limit ourselves to the notion that we always need a ton of data to be successful. And if we all remember our history and, and so on, discontinuous success has happened in the absence of data. You know, before the iPhone showed up, for example, yeah. there was no iPhone. Yeah. And therefore we had a discontinuous behavioral, technological, and everything that happened has happened after. So it isn't necessary that we need to pour a ton of data into yeah. an issue because sometimes we may not have it. So what do we do? We wait and wait and people die? No, you have to make the best with what you have. But that's the point, Ian, the technology today and AI today is so powerful that it can actually take a small amount of data and make hay with it and make good hay with it. Hmm. That's what excites what, me. What do you see? What do you see the next, next five years? I, and I think five years is a very long time. What do you see <laughs> the next five years as with the evolution of technology in general, yeah. And its impact on healthcare, like where could we be in the next five years? So um, that's such a great question. And whether it is five years or one year or 10 years, and then we can, we, uh, it will be fun to think about 50 years from now. Yes. But what a great and difficult question. And thank you for putting me on the spot, right? I appreciate <laughs> it on a, on a Friday morning. But uh, I, I think um, you, you chose the five-year time frame you know, very wisely. There is a lot going on in the space of AI and healthcare right now. Um, and it spans the gamut from can we diagnose things earlier based on what we are measuring in blood. So there are technologies coming online that out of the tiniest amount of blood, they will measure 5,000, 10,000, basically everything that is in a tiny drop of blood. Every little protein, every little amino acid, every little peptide, every yeah. little sugar, all of yeah. these things will be measured. Now that will be incredible data to prosecute and to stick into a big computer and see what comes yeah. out. Because yeah. if we can do it with a pinprick of blood, then in the near future, maybe seven to 10 years, we'll be able to do it from an eye drop, mm. from a tear, and tears are very diagnostic of a whole bunch of things, from saliva, mm. from urine. And so there is, um, uh, what happens now and where the two will meet is, our ability, Ian, to measure things far exceeds our ability to understand what we measure. Yeah. 
Yeah. In the course of human history, we've always been able, able to measure things, see things through a telescope, whatever it is through a microscope first, of course, before yeah. we understand what it is we're looking at. So, yeah. so the asymptotes are coming together. And what we will see in the next five years is the ability to interpret a whole bunch of data that are coming online that are just shit, sitting on shelves right now, not doing anything. Um, one of my favorites, I'll just finish off this segment yeah, as it were. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorites is uh, the smart fridge, right? So everybody, you know, you, everybody's fridge will have a, will be Internet of Things connected and this, that, and the other. Well, what if your health issues through whatever apps and diagnostics are connected to your fridge so that your fridge reminds you, hey, you're overdoing it with the ice cream today. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or you Absolutely. need a few more broccoli stems, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's connected not to your behaviors, but to your health first. Yeah. And then your behaviors, things like that. And I can think of a, of of something of of a funny thing as well is when the evolution of the smart watches will you know continue, and uh, maybe when you have that extra scoop of ice cream, you actually get zapped by a small electric shock, and your <laughs> your watch tells you don't eat any more of this because you're overdoing it, and and all oh, that, that is, is funny. possible. Yeah, all I that like is that. possible. Uh, you know what? There's there is this. A tremendous amount of opportunity in the world, I believe. You know, technology yeah, is sure. opening up a lot of doors, but there's also a lot of um, imbalance. You know, in many yeah. places we're doing well, but in many places we're not doing well. We're seeing now that in in remote rural areas where healthcare was previously uh, unavailable, now there is small devices. And there's, a, as an example, there's a small little. Um, ultrasound device that you can hook up to your smartphone and it's a tiny device and it's an ultrasound. It's an uh -huh. ultrasound. And previously you would need to go to a doctor and in many places it's not even available. And that scale of technology that it's gone from that big machinery in a hospital to a small portable device like this that can yeah. sit in your pocket. It's incredible. The access to things that healthcare, that technology can bring is, is just mind boggling. And I really like that. So tell me something. Do you believe that healthcare and all these things are becoming um, more affordable to the rest of the world as we go on? Because right now, maybe some, some things are really expensive. We can't have them. Is affordability something that will happen as a result of technology becoming more persuasive? What, what a great question. And again, a Friday difficult question, which, which I guess it, it deserves. So, um, you know, you remind me of the car industry. Um, and in the car industry, the expensive developments that happen in Formula One and are tested there eventually trickle down to the little cheap sedan that I drive, right? So at the end of the day, there is this process of where at the beginning it's expensive and not accessible, but then because as we all know, the market grows and explodes and availability and demand, it makes it possible to make it cheaper. But one of the things that is interesting, Ian, is that a lot of these developments now, 15, 20 years ago, would cost billions of dollars to be achieved. Yeah. But now they cost a few hundred thousand dollars to be achieved yeah. Yeah. because the pieces are off the shelf. The sensors, to do, for example, to have another gizmo that you stick to your iPhone and you blow into, those sensors are off the shelf. Yeah. So already the infrastructure has appeared that makes a lot of these new combinations of products and services cheaper. So you're absolutely right. It is granular right now, but there is no doubt that within our lifetimes, most of the things that make a material difference to our health will be much cheaper than they are now and much more widely available. For sure. From from what you thank you, and from what you've written in 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 your in your article as well in the book is uh, the fact that um, is accuracy is the accuracy of these devices that's increasing. Uh, tell me a little bit about it because you've written uh, something about it in 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 your essay as well. Is accuracy increasing and diagnostic capability of these machines and technologies becoming better day by day? Well, if it didn't, then it would fail miserably uh, out of the gate. And at least one of the things that is interesting today, and one of the questions that I have that I have no answer to is, is our ability to kill bad ideas and bad technologies better than mm -hmm. it was before? Or are we are allowing subpar solutions to propagate for marketing reasons, right? 
So that's something that troubles me, especially in healthcare. Are we allowing subpar things to prevail, whereas better solutions are not allowed to prevail or don't have the resources yeah. to prevail? And I think that's probably, a, at least from my biased perspective, a more interesting way of thinking about it. And of course, yes. that goes to the question of accuracy. There is no doubt that accuracy is increasing, but is our ability to benchmark that accuracy mm -hmm. increasing? And the answer to that is no. So we although we have better technology because that is driven by humans and that is driven by egos and perspectives and biases, how we benchmark the performance is less driven by the actual performance than by whatever, you know, biases we have to confirm what we love. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It does. It, it makes perfect sense. I would recommend everybody, honestly, watching the show to buy Aftershock and, and to learn more about uh, the amazing work that Eris does and uh, the rest of the 50 people who've contributed to the book. Including too. you. Including <laughs> myself. And I'm very humble and uh, I'm very lucky to be part of this, uh, this group of uh, amazing, amazing people. Eris, we're out of time. I wish we could be on for another hour. <laughs> But tell our viewers, where can they find more information about you and where can they find uh, more information about your work? Uh, BioVista.com. Our company is called BioVistas.com. And uh, it's a wonderful place to be in, in work and uh, deal with the future. So, so thank you for having me. It's been All a right. pleasure. Eris, such a pleasure. And we'll be in touch. Uh, we look forward to having you uh, on board again. And, and reading about your incredible work uh, in the future. Thank you so much. Feeling is mutual. All right. Bye. You take care. Thank you so much. Bye. Hey, friend. This is Ian Khan. If you liked what you saw on my video, then please subscribe to my YouTube channel and be inspired every single day with innovative content that keeps you fresh, updated, and ready for the future. For more information, also visit my website at iankhan.com. 